Mohammed Barakat is the managing director of the U.S. Qatar uh, Business Council in Washington, D.C., where he works with the po public and private sectors uh, to promote new and expanded business relationships between the U.S. and Qatari companies. Uh, he manages a wide range of activities in programs, advisory services, uh, market research, and member services, and provides business and cultural advisory services to both U.S. and Qatari companies. Hello. Good afternoon. How are you, sir? I'm good. How are you? Thanks for taking the time to do this with us. We're very interested to hear what's happening in Qatar and how Qatar uh, as one of the leaders within the greater Gulf states is, is uh, able to speak to some of these topics. So I'm looking forward to our conversation. For sure. Yes, definitely. Thank you for having me and really appreciate uh, uh, you know, being involved with you guys uh, specifically on these important causes that are affecting the whole world uh, from the environment to the sustainability to what we have been witnessing in the last, I would say, year and a half since the pandemic started, where we have seen real, real-time scenarios when, when it comes to the world, uh, all at some point comes to a halt, and and how this actually affected, um, you know, the world, the Middle East, uh, the United States, you know, being, you know, uh, uh, looking at it as an American, but also coming from the Middle East and working on many issues in the Middle East. Um, it's just it's just fascinating, I would say. Um, so Qatar serves as one of the primary thought leaders and economic leaders of the Middle East. And uh, so much positive has come out of this country. Uh, there's a very strong uh, relationship with the United States, certainly on trade and business exchange uh, across the world. We've come through a pretty wild pandemic. Uh, it's been awful watching what's happened in so many people's lives, whether they lost their life or whether their businesses or incomes were destroyed or they were, they were caught up in the, the many expressions of social upheaval uh, around the world. When you look back over the last year, uh, what, what lessons do you observe that came out of this that perhaps have been adopted by the, uh, the, the population in Qatar and the greater Middle East that we can look forward to seeing on an ongoing basis, those adopted lessons? Yes, of course. Um, I mean, um, uh, this pandemic, um, it, we haven't seen something like this in in very long time. And I would say in some uh, recorded with social media and as much as we are today where we we get all this news as fast as, uh, as it can. Uh, we haven't seen something like this. And so the pandemic, I think, starting by day one of the world realizing that we are at a verge of something really serious. Um, uh, people started running to try to figure out what are they gonna do? And, and I recall the first three to four months of the pandemic, everyone was thinking this is gonna end soon we will be able to control it, um, which we didn't. I mean, here we are today and, uh, and we're still um, dealing with issues. Some countries uh, more than uh, the others. Uh, I think the pandemic started with a pause bottom, what everyone started looking into their lives, companies, corporations, states, where they're realizing everything that we have done could stop. And it did stop in many countries in, in, in no time. Um, what did they prepare? Um, they started looking at their plans, looking into have we, have we done something um, in, in a simulation way that actually could uh, help us here. Some countries did, but still uh, it was bigger than everyone's uh, expectation when it came that the whole globe suddenly came to that pause. What did we learn from this and how the Middle East and, 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 and people in, in the Gulf? I think a lot of people started realizing that we can live differently. We can work differently. Uh, we started working remotely. Schools shifted remotely. We have heard, you know, colleges, universities doing online and, and, and web education. But in, in a sudden where K to 12 and everyone, you know, somewhat in the world 
needing to shift to online um, made us realize that this is possible today. Uh, but also, the most important part in this, that also makes us realize that not everyone have access to the internet, data. Um, some people are fortunate to have that, some people are not. Um, families with more than one kid started realizing it's not just one computer anymore. It, we need more than one computer. Um, so uh, that's only on, on, on our regular life, but also on the health system. The health systems, the ability for the health system to respond to such uh, um, you know, urgent matters, the capacity of it. Uh, what do we have to offer to the people? Shifting from regular medicine to telemedicine, that's something that, you know, specifically in the Middle East, if we want to mention the Middle East and the Gulf, people are used to meet their doctor. They do like that personal relationship. Today, um, and, and, and during this year and a half, appointments are being done um, uh, over the, uh, uh, you know, the web, Zoom, whatever the platform that it's used. And people started realizing that they might be able to spend more time with their doctors um, rather than traveling. Now, what else this, uh, in a way, I would see in the Middle East? The first three to four months we have seen, we have witnessed, the environment started getting back in balance. Um, it was interesting and it was fascinating. Less cars or even no cars in many uh, countries um, with, with, you know, uh, curfews and so on you started seeing some wildlife coming back. Uh, the air quality has changed as well. Uh, and then now we have people not going back and forth in the US, we see this as well uh, in major cities in Washington, DC, less cars mean less traffic, less commute, more time to do other things. And at the same time, the environment has st started shifting. Um, so I would say listen, learned, and what people have done People started learning that we don't need to be always in the office. That's one. Two, how much impact humans have on the environment um, through a small pause. I mean, there's so many simulations that you can run, but there's nothing that reality. Reality came and it says, take a break. And then suddenly we started seeing things changing. Um, so I think a lot of the countries, a lot of the states, a lot of the corporations started realizing that we can do this, we can do remote, we can actually reduce our carbon footprint somehow through utilization of uh, new means uh, that we, we, we do. Now, the other reality that came uh, to place is that the point that I mentioned, who does have access to this and to the internet? Um, not everyone does. So how can we actually get this to them. In the GCC, in Qatar somehow, 98% um, 90, almost of the country is covered with fiber optic, which is amazing. 5G technology actually worked really well because they have deployed it almost a year and a half ago. Some other countries in the Middle East are almost there or, if, or, or there already. We look back in the United States in home, we look back home and we realize that we are not there yet. We don't have fiber optic everywhere. Some people still are using ADSL and, and slower speed internet. Um, so I think we, we noticed something interesting where emerging markets, countries that actually built things just recently, in a way managed the situation with the pandemic better than, you know, situation what happened in Europe, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic and, and in the United States as well. So I think we got to the point where it's, it doesn't mean that you're number one economy in the world, that you can manage a pandemic better than the others. Now, later stage, yes, these developing countries started manufacturing the vaccines and doing more research, but it's, it's just, it's just like that new balance where, where do we fit all these lessons learned from this pandemic, the pause, our ability to realize that how can emerging markets are handling this better than, you know, uh, uh, biggest, the biggest economies in the world. Um, it's, it's something that I think will give everyone a pause and realize, okay, 
this is something new. And I think it also showed us what leadership in business, in uh, economists, in, 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 in the medical field, and in politics at the end, how much impact they can have in a major pandemic on a global level, where everyone is trying to help their own rather than at the beginning of the pandemic, everyone's just trying to help their own. Yeah. They can't even yet get to help you know, their neighbors or their allies. And then later on, we started doing this and that. Like right now, we're trying to help countries that needs more uh, assistance. So, so I think a lot, of, a lot was learned um, uh, from this pandemic. And I think it will be recorded for, and it will be studied for, for a while um, in, in, in economy, in business, and in, in politics, and where it all feeds to, you know, human, the human impact and the effect that we have on our planet um, in the future. Qatar has been a, a great country to get out ahead of the petro dollar to transform itself into a very diversified economy. Um, what are we what are we expecting economically uh, in the region from uh, this country? And how do we see it continuing to innovate and uh, and lead within the, the Middle East? So um, I think one one of the wonderful thing that you have seen in Qatar, they actually established a long-term vision. Um, the 2030 vision in Qatar did actually have, you know, the human impact, the environment, sustainability. And, and, and that vision was done a long time ago. Um, in moving away from hydrocarbon or focus on hydrocarbon, I think, um, also allowed them to think clearly for the future. Yes, they are one of the uh, number one export of LNG. Um, but they're one of the biggest investors in solar energy as well. Um, they're investing not just in, 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 in their own country, they're doing it in other countries. They have investments in Jordan, different areas in, in the Middle East. And I think what they see is happening that they need to bring more people to the country. They need more uh, investors, more actually people living, not just money coming in. It's people coming in and live. So. At some point when they started focusing on the sports um, and now they have the uh, FIFA World Cup 2022 coming in, uh, in, in a year and a half now, um, that will put a major spotlight on the country. Yeah. Uh, will make people, of course, witness in the Middle East, the, uh, uh, the Gulf region, Qatar in specific, um, that will drive tourism, that will drive more people willing to actually move there, live there. Um, they worked on the education system, uh, foreign universities, uh, six, seven American universities, uh, European universities, and so on. So you have, you're, you're looking into a complete ecosystem when it comes to what can you do and what can, what can you actually achieve in Qatar? You can work, you can live, you can get a good education for your kids, but also you have a very great location with a regional access. Um, almost 800 million people within that radius, talking about from India to Pakistan, the whole GCC, uh, the rest of the Middle East, um, from Jordan and Syria and up to all the way to Turkey. So doing that, investing on the logistics, but also I think one good thing that they have done, um, and it's fascinating, is that they want it the top technologies. They wanted also more green technologies, environmentally friendly technologies. Why? Because they knew in, in a way that the world is shifting towards places with zero carbon uh, footprint. In some cases in Qatar, they're selling carbon credits, which is, which is something you know, that everyone now is looking for. Um, you see the world shifting from major manufacturing industrial countries for, for the last hundred years. And now they are looking for places that they can offer that. So if they can start capturing these opportunities, it will be wonderful. But it's not just within their borders. They're doing it outside their borders. They're doing it within with their neighbors. They're doing it within you know the countries that they can work with through their investments, through their cooperation, um, and working with 
the international community on, on business corporations in finding better ways to achieve things. Now, if it's, if it, if it's, if anything, it's a good marketing tool. Um, and, and, and that's, and that's, and that's, that's something good, you know, why not help the environment and at the same time boost your economy and, and get more corporations in. So, um, I think they're, they're on a good path toward, you know, um, uh, being one of the regional players when it comes to business um, with all their offerings. I think the region is shifting there. Even the reforms that they implemented within their laws and regulations, um, we see a lot of other countries in the region actually doing that. Um, and hopefully, you know, once, once we see more political stability in the region, uh, especially in the conflict zones um, in Syria, Afghanistan, uh, Iraq, um, we'll see more, more regional reach uh, and, and more, more interest. Um, and diversifying from the hydrocarbon is the future. Um, so um, in a way, I hope I answered your question. Um, huh. that, that, uh, that model seems very successful. And I think even, uh, uh, I would say, big economies and huge economies, they started learning. Um, also from the world, the emerging markets, and how can we do the same? Um, which is, you know, it's it's an interesting shift. Yes. Yeah. Uh, going back to what we were talking about earlier, which was the lessons observed, lessons learned through this pandemic to date. Um, it's interesting to watch human behavior. I know in the United States, we often get very focused on a thing and we start out, but as the crisis pass, we then kind of regress back into our old behaviors. Uh, we don't make permanent changes. When you look at the future of the Middle East and what's happening right now, and some of these major pivots that have been taken, what are you predicting, Mohammed? There will be the permanent changes as a result that we won't shift back from, but we'll stay on a new trajectory. We talked about the digitalization of education. We, we've talked about people flying less, going to places less. We've talked about a new very front of mind consciousness toward uh, equitable access to things like the internet, uh, to information and data. Um, we've talked about a new consciousness toward environmental awareness and responsibility. Uh, but will these things permanently shift or are they just for a moment? What do you think? So I believe there will be things that uh, will be somewhat permanent. Um, uh, I think when people start getting used to uh, doing medical appointments uh, without going to the doctors necessarily, um, unless if it's, of course, something that they have to do an X-ray or a blood test, um, I think people start getting used to it. It's a year and a half. It was not like a quick thing and, and, and we're going back. Right. Uh, they did have to deal with this for a year and a half. So, and, and I think that's where the human behavior is changing. People are accepting it more. Um, a year and a half, people, maybe the first three, four, five months, they didn't actually um, download the app or delay their appointments. But now they're like, no, like we have to do this. So I think this will be imprinted in, in, in their mind as a possible way in the system will start offering these things. People will start taking it because now they know it. So I think there, that something will become, when I say somewhat permanent, where people are uh, using it more and now they think it's easier. Why get in my car and find a way to get to that medical appointment? And, and how about you know um, the, uh, the elders, the seniors, that maybe they don't drive anymore. Um, no one needs to take them anymore because they can meet their doctor online. Um, so I think that's, that's something that will be imprinted and it will affect the human behavior. Of course, there's some things that will snap back. People will still want to go out. People will still don't want to socially distance. And, and not necessarily. I mean, humans need to interact with each other. Yes. Um, but I think some other imprinted things, personal hygiene has changed in, in the world. In the Middle East, people start understanding that. Um, personal space is becoming something that people really understand. When you talk about the Middle East, not just the Gulf, you know, people are warm and they do like to 
interact with each other uh, very closely. It's a little bit different than we see here in the United States or in Europe. Um, that's a new idea now that people actually really appreciate it, that space uh, being in there. So I think these are will become permanent changes. Um, education, you mentioned that, uh, will in a way understand it, that you don't need to go across the globe to maybe establish a baseline of education will be something uh, that we uh, uh, will become permanent. Now, the other thing that I think one uh, critical part, um, the readiness for something like this in the future, I think that will be permanent. Uh, countries being ready for this, people being ready for this psychologically, uh, the ability to deal with it, I think is permanent. Um, or at least is permanent as much as human memory can maintain this and passing it generation to, uh, uh, to, to, to other. But it's not going to be the first time, and it's not going to be the last time that we will face something like this. So I think the readiness, people acceptance, people understanding how dangerous it is to be in such situation in the future. Now on the corporate, on the business side, I think corporations started dealing with this better um, in understanding how this you know, will impact them. So more people will work from home. Uh, we have seen and we started feeling this uh, shift. Now, in the Middle East specifically, working from home was, I don't want to say a foreign um, idea, but more of what do you mean working from home? Um, now we see that with, with, that, with, the, with the need to do this, we knew, with the new systems for working from home, even to monitor people and see production uh, and producti productivity when it comes to Again, maybe not manufacturing jobs where you need your hands um, um, to deal with something. But they saw that maybe we don't need this. And now what would this do to the environment, the world, Middle East? I think when you need less office buildings, of course, that's better and that's greener. There's more lands to maybe, I mean, it depends on the country, but maybe more lands to farm. Um, if, if that's possible, but if, if it's not in some you know, countries that they don't have that farming resources available to them, but that's less, less, less concrete. Um, yeah. So, um, you know, we, we've watched in the region, uh, as you referred to them as conflict zones, we've, we, we're, we've watched the, the unfortunate, the sad, the tragic loss of life that's been happening in Syria for far too long. And now we have international players trying to get involved there. And I, who, you know, who knows what that means. Um, I think there's always the unsteadiness of what's happening in Iran and um, uh, concerns there. And then, of course, of just late in the last few days, we've seen a new escalation of conflict going on with Israel and, uh, and the Palestinian uh, people. And so there, we're seeing these things. Of course, Yemen has been through its own uh, tragedy for a period. Uh, but yet we've seen some good things. We saw, at least we've seen uh, the beginning of some peace with these Abraham Accords starting out with Israel and, the, and Saudi and the United Arab Emirates. Uh, what, what, can we, what can we give hope in, put our hope in regarding uh, the future of the area settling down so that it becomes a place of stability, a place of high attraction, that there's not this uncertainty about this. Any, any thoughts about where we're going on that trajectory? Um, you know, the Middle East for, I would say, hundreds of years has been always a, a hot zone. Um, it's not something new. But I think since we've been so talking about the pandemic, I think the pandemic have brought perspective to that we all are affected by a small thing. It's a little tiny virus that brings us all down and makes us all need to cooperate together and work together. Um, and th I think that's a good thing, understanding that it's not, not the virus. It's the virus is not a good thing, but at least understanding that we're all in, in this together. I think it level set us all. It, it does, it yeah. does. And it, and it gives, again, that pause where people started realizing, well, I can't run away from this anymore. Um, it's not just like, you know, when there's a war in a zone, uh, in a war zone, maybe someone have the ability to hop on a plane and go somewhere else. Um, with the pandemic, countries were all dealing with the same thing. 
Um, now, I feel people started realizing that we need to help each other. We need to work with each other. And that's something is very critical in the Middle East. Um, history uh, for many, many years, um, you know, always tell us where um, these conflicts come from, um, you know, economical issues, people feeling that they cannot fulfill their things. But also, I mean, not going far away from it is the education, you know, like not getting enough education, um, not being able to understand what's going on. In, and a lot of people, honestly, just learning about other countries through TV and now the internet, which is not always right, and that's not always correct, and it's not always the truth, you know, coming through these channels that pour in and, and you learn something. So maybe the ability to get this education without the need to go to school um, physically will help uh, in this region. Um, but again, you mentioned very hot zones, Iran, Syria, um, the world at the end came to a point where they need to help each other. Um, yeah. And these good gestures will hopefully make the people understand. It's not just about the regimes and the systems in the region. It's the people that needs to see it. It's unfortunate. You just mentioned the most recent um, uh, uh, conflict, you know, the, 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 in, in a way it's somewhat a war uh, between the Israelis and the Palestinians. But I think people during the pandemic, honestly, not, not like necessarily Israelis and Palestinians, but people in general being trapped at home um, for almost a year, um, not able to leave the country and, and, and do anything in a way, um, they don't feel good. And so there's a lot of energy that needs to come out. So hopefully, you know, we'll see more closer collaboration economically. People will, will I think people paused when the environment started balancing itself in the first three months of the pandemic. And they saw birds that I saw videos where people were shocked that have been seen in their area for a while. Yeah. I think they started realizing this is something, this is, this is the life that we need. This is, you know, and, and this only comes with peace. War only brings um, more affecting the environment. It's dangerous and it kills people. But at the same time, you don't end up living a normal life. Um, no. And I, I think everyone now realizes what is, you know, when, when someone maybe somewhere in, in the West have to spend two to three months somewhat not able to go anywhere because of the pandemic, maybe that will give them a pause and understand what does that mean when a, when a country is under an embargo, you know, when people can't leave their homes because there's, you know, planes bombing out there. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. It's, a, it's just a human... I think the human understanding gets closer when, when we start identifying and feel uh, the same way. Um, that's, that's an, again, the Middle East is a very complicated situation. We can't it even good. address it in, in, in hours or days maybe of discussion. But, but I think, I hope, um, and I think that um, this pandemic hopefully will bring a little bit more uh, uh, closer understanding when it comes to understanding the other uh, and feeling with the other rather than, you know, eliminating the other and pushing them back. Um, I, I hear you. I, I This is our great hope. So yeah. uh, tell us, what is the mission of the U.S. Qatar uh, Business Council? And and uh, what is the 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 value proposition of this council of for American businesses in Qatar and for the Qatar work going abroad. Of course. Um, so the U.S. Qatar Business Council was actually established in 1996, so uh, a long time ago. And the most important mission is bringing people together when it comes to uh, uh, business collaboration, trade, exports, and imports. It depends on the country. We focus on helping American companies explore business opportunities in Qatar, find business opportunities in Qatar, um, as well maybe invest in Qatar when it comes to uh, doing uh, business uh, in Qatar. Understand the bigger picture of Qatar, not just as one small market, but the regional reach of that market. Um, on the other side, um, helping Qatari companies identify business opportunities in the United States, but as well finding um, investment opportunities, maybe actually utilizing our network in the United States um, in, in helping them find partners uh, going back. Um, and with all this, we work closely with the private sector. This is our main 
um, I mean, our our supporters actually, and, and the way that we function, we're a non for profit. So we're all our mission is to help uh, the companies, but we work closely with the governments. We work with Qatar, we work with the United States, in bringing this understanding where how we just talked about regional impacts, how a small thing in the region could affect American businesses in Wisconsin or in Alabama, where people don't even see this. They don't understand why, why would, you know, 8,000 miles or 12,000 miles away, how would this affect me in Mobile, Alabama, right? Um, that's something we bring to the table. We, I call it, you know, we, we educate and then we advocate on behalf of these businesses and on behalf of this relationship. I personally believe, and and and, and I'm, I, I worked in in several fields before being, you know, in business. I believe business facilitate a way uh, where people can actually talk, um, and and it's helpful, you know. It's uh, uh, even if it's business, even if it's about sometimes money, but if in this case we can, you know, get people to talk and understand each other. If I can get someone to. Uh, travel from you know Milwaukee to visit the Middle East and Qatar and learn something new while they you know make business. Um, I think that's that's a good channel uh, that we as a council hope to always facilitate and open up the uh, the business channels and that brings uh, many other channels and in, in the process. Um, and hopefully you know we we do promote and we work closely with um, entities that they want to improve sustainability in the world so if the byproducts of uh, business interaction and business uh, uh, engagements is helping uh, the the planet in a way and humanity connects um, then it's a it's it's a double win and I think from in, in my opinion I think that's very well said I think that such a business council sets the platform for a new and more positive diplomacy not only at the business level, but from people to people, which is really fantastic. Mohammed Barakat, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. We value your comments. Thanks for thank that. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much.